Okay, we're going to go ahead and present the gifts. And like I said, if you don't mind just lining up, we want to take a picture. Um, Jason Ivey, which he couldn't be here today, but I'm going to present it to Miss Pat Ivey. Um, graduated from Commerce High School, Aeronautic Mechanic um, Trade School he plans to go to. So, I believe this is his. Make sure, yes. Thank you. Congratulations to him. Judd Brashears. I don't know why I'm looking at the red. I did this on purpose because it's Pottsville. Pottsville High School. Um, he actually went to school, let me say this correctly, this year at UACCM, and he's going to continue. Is that correct? He's going to continue there with IMMT HVAC. Is that, did I say that correctly? Congratulations to Judd Brashears. <laughs> Shira Simpson. Shira graduated from Russellville School District, and actually she was a majorette um, for her whole career, correct? Yes. And uh, she's planning on going to Arkansas Tech at Ozark and majoring in banking. Congratulations, Shira. <laughs> James Edgar. He graduated from Russellville High School, and he plans on going to Arkansas Tech University to major in cyber security. Interesting. And then Victoria, Miss Dawn, will you come take this, please? Victoria Such, she graduated from Russellville High School, and her plan is to do some online school. Congratulations to Victoria. You do some things. All right, congratulations to the graduates, and afterwards we have hot dogs and um, chips and a big cake. So stay for after, after lunch, okay? We just wanted to make sure our graduates were remembered. 2020 has not been an, a usual or normal year for our graduates, and we're just glad that we can celebrate with them that milestone in their life. And if my grandson does get a degree in cyberspace technology, lock your computers down. <laughs> All right. Let's have a word of prayer as we go to the start tonight. And Father, we just thank you for these young people, for their aspirations, for their future, for <clears throat> the effort they've put in to come in all this way so far and the effort they're going to put into towards their future lives. We just ask your blessings upon them. Watch care over them. Help them to grow and mature in the Lord. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you. Let's all stand. What a mighty God we serve is what we're going to start with this morning. We do indeed serve a mighty God. What a mighty God we serve, what a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before Him, heaven and earth adore Him. What a mighty God we serve, what a mighty God we serve, what a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him, heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. The mighty God we serve, are you washed in the blood, cleansing power of the blood? Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in grace this hour are you washed in the blood of the lamb are you washed in the blood in the soul cleansing blood of the lamb are your garments spotless are they white as snow are you washed in the blood of the lamb are you 
theme of preaching this month instead of reading scripture I had something I wanted to share with everybody this morning um, I have picked out some scripture I wanted to read by the way if I offend anybody my name's Cody Bird <laughs> uh, Philippians chapter 2 talks about imitating Christ's humility um, about uh, our relationships with one another, and I'll be honest with you, uh, I don't know of another church out there that can hold a lot for Crow Mountain Baptist Church to go by when it comes to loving each other, reaching out to each other, making sure everybody's got what you need, especially during these last two or three months when uh, we were in lockdown, couldn't come to church. Um, I know the deacons tried real hard to keep up with everybody, and we found ourselves in competition with you guys, actually, checking on everybody, because we would call and check on somebody and they say yeah I've, I've talked to Mary Stewart of uh, Gene Taters talked to Mary Stewart and I mean just it was just constant so it's just uh, it's just a what it is it's just a completion of scripture um, that that I found here in Philippians chapter 2 it's uh, verse 1 through 5 it says therefore if you having any encouragement from being united with Christ if any comfort from his love if any common sharing in the spirit if any tenderness and compassion to make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the mind, same mindset as Jesus Christ. Man, I saw that just like everybody did, carried out day in and day out. And uh, I just, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is that it's, it may sound corny, but I, I'm, I'm proud of of everything that we accomplished during this difficult time because of um, because I don't think anybody felt neglected or I hope they didn't so anyway that's what I got to say so uh, if you would if you'll join me in a word of prayer then we'll get back to the service <clears throat> Lord we just we just thank you Lord that uh, that we have carried out your will in this church Lord and reached out to others and, and made sure that everybody was felt loved and taken care of and watched over and we just thank you lord that that we just uh have that kind of atmosphere here within this church and it's because of the love uh, love for you lord that we each share that we uh, have compassion not only for our brothers and sisters but we just recognize the need for you in our lives and we just thank you for that lord that that we're at that place in our lives we just pray that you continue to work through us to reach out to this community to let others see uh, the path that we're laying out, Lord, for, for them to follow and see that they want, they want what we got, Lord, which is a, a solid relationship with you. We just pray that you just continue to work through us for this community. Thank you, Lord, for everyone here and for the part that they play in the success of this church. And we just ask most of all, Lord, for you to continue to extend to us your grace and mercy. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Draw me close to you. Draw me close to you.
and I'm your friend. You are my desire. No one else will do. Cause nothing else can take your place. How many of y'all remember your graduation day? Yeah. Mine was way back there. We graduated in 1965. And it was shortly after that that I got engaged. And it was shortly after that in 1966 in August that I was married. The things that I thought about as I was Standing with our class, we had, uh, had at Hannibal Grange High School, there was 475 of us. And while I was standing there, I thought, man, I'm going to take this diploma. I'm free. I can do whatever I want to. I'm 18 years old. I'm my own boss. They still had to have my mom sign for me when I got married because I was only 18 in Missouri. With freedom comes a lot of responsibility. And this morning I want to talk about freedom. Because if anything is being attacked besides the church today, it's our freedom. 
I really believe that we are about to become embattled in a means by which to protect our freedom. And I want to remind you young people what your responsibility is concerning freedom. Because freedom has to come in certain ways. There are several forms of freedom that we've got to deal with. In Galatians, the fifth chapter, starting on verse 1 through 3, and then we'll skip over to 13 through 16, says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And if I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to the whole law. Verse 13, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest ye be consumed by one another. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, your words are strong, your words are powerful, and they give us right direction. We ask that as we look at your word and understand it better, that we might be able to Take from here a lesson concerning liberty and freedom. Concerning how we as Christians need to observe it and to be a part of it. Forgive us of not understanding before, Lord, but let us now understand through the power of the Holy Spirit what you have given us through grace and mercy. We ask this in the name of Jesus, for he is worthy. Amen. Next week, or next Saturday, this coming Saturday, is the 4th of July. Going to be a lot of you celebrating fireworks and also with barbecues and family gatherings and remembering. You do know what 4th of July is, don't you? It was the remembrance of our independence as a nation. Our freedom from a totalitarian government that was overruling the people. Why did we do that in 1776? Well, the reason that we started to move away from our control over England was because of the unfairness that was being cast upon the people of the land. And we have a difficult start. Even after the Revolutionary War took place, we really were not firm in our understanding as a nation of freedom. It took several years and several forms of government that we went through before we came to the one that we exist in now. The Constitution didn't come overnight, folks. The Articles of, of Freedom did not come overnight. They had to be worked out and there were still struggles amongst the states in putting that thing together. But we celebrate 1776 because it was our declaration of independence. For you, as graduates, it's kind of your declaration of independence. As I told my kids when they turned 18, you are independent. You are free to do what you want to. You're free to get a job. You're free to go to college. Or you're free to go into military. You make your choice. But you're not going to be a couch potato. Not going to sit and play games. Not going to just wait for mom and dad to do things. You're going to get into the world of being free as an adult. Yes. That's what's required now. That freedom is precious though. There are three ways that freedom comes. Nearly two and a half centuries ago, a few men assembled in Philadelphia and endorsed the words of Thomas Jefferson that perfected one of the major political revolutions in the human history. Words that stirred the feelings of people who seek and value freedom. These words were written amongst our declaration. We hold these truths to be self-evident, 
that all men are created equal, and that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That comes just before our Constitution, before our Articles. Freedom is the ideal of every age. Where do we seek it? How do we exercise it? Well, let's consider some of those forms that people quest for liberty with. Number one, some seek freedom by force. People who want freedom for themselves seek it through force. You see, what they want, they take. We're seeing a lot of that today in America. People who say they don't have the freedom to do what they want to, they're doing what they want to by force and taking what they want. They're seeking after a freedom not for all individuals, but for their own agenda and for themselves. That's what force does. The philosophy of this quest is that might makes right. It's a philosophy of the bully who demands that others give in to his worships, or his wishes. He uses verbal force or threats when possible and physical force or violence when necessary. Jesus said, all that take or live by the sword shall perish by the sword. Didn't have that version before, have you? But when you read that and you take it into the original Greek, it says all that live by the sword, all that that take by the sword shall die by the sword. The fastest gun in the West was a wanted man. Did you know that? He was wanted by every other gunman who wanted to be faster than him. And that always met with a challenge. Eventually, somebody come along that was faster. Then they became the fastest man in the West. But that's what force does when it seeks freedom. To be best. To be better than the other teams. I've seen some teams that have come together and they cheat and they uh, commit all kinds of errors and all kinds of, of uh, issues in the, in the game that they, they uh, cause all kinds of problems just to win. They're wanting to seek their agenda by force. The exercise of raw force inspires in its victims a yearning for real freedom. Did you know that? When English officials used imprisonment in 1667 in an effort to force William Penn to give up Quaker views, he said, the jail will be my grave before I change one jot. The tower was the worst argument to use against me, for whoever may be right or wrong, those who use force can never be right. Force instills into some people, into most people, a desire for freedom another way. We're seeing force being used today in America. Now, we haven't seen physical force yet. Notice I use the word yet. But we are seeing mental force being used. Mental perversive persuasion. All kinds of propaganda being used. Trying to force us into one way or another. Friends, I want you to know that there's no government in the world that can outshine who Jesus Christ is. And there's no group of people, regardless of what their agenda is, regardless of what their idea is, that is best for all people. Because usually when somebody says, well, you know, it's best for the world if we do this, they're saying, no, it's best for me. It's best for me that we do this. This is freedom by force. It's not one that Jesus recommends. It's not one that I recommend. Matter of fact, I'm just the opposite. I'm one that says that we need to stand against force like this. That we may have to one day stand up and be counted. I was trying to think who it was that said every once in a while the tree of liberty needs to be watered with the bloods of the patriots. Patrick, Patrick Henry, I think that's what my wife's right, Patrick Henry. We may be at that point in our lives, in the lives of our children. 
that we may have come to that point in which we're going to have to defend the tree of liberty. What's the second way? Well, most freak seek freedom through law. Now, Paul was speaking to the law of this in this passage in Galatians. He was speaking to the Jewish law that had called, demanded that if you're going to be a true follower of God, that you all, the males had to be circumcised. That was part of their religion. And Paul was saying, look, you're not under the law anymore. You're under grace. Excuse me, my wife said Thomas Jefferson was the one who said that. The, uh, the question of grace and law has always had a tension. What can we do under grace? And what's allowed under law? Well, the Jew Judaizers were trying to get the Christians of that day, who were Gentiles, to go back to the old method of law by causing them all to go through the processes and the, the rituals of Judaism. Well, Paul said, look, you've been released from that bondage. You no longer have to do that. That doesn't mean that he was saying the Ten Commandments didn't have any purpose because they did, because the Ten Commandments have always been a guidepost, a guideline, folks. But they have added so many laws to their Jewish rituals that at one point, on one given day, there were over 365 laws you had to observe. They had let law take over. Now, America would be in terrible strait if there had not been for the Declaration of Independence. And especially for the U.S. Constitution, the Bill of Rights. Those are the laws that we have in our nation that's supposed to give us freedom to do what we want to do. But it's interesting that those same laws protect those who want to protest or those who want to speak out against the government to allow them to do so. But yet that's because the law has stated that every person has freedom and liberty. And so interpretation gets into that law and it makes it difficult sometimes to know what's right and what's wrong. See, that's the problem with law. Once you set one law out, there comes a, uh, someone who will criticize that law and say, no, that law doesn't apply to me. The philosophy of freedom through law is, as Gerald Ford said, our President Gerald Ford said, he phrased it in his inaugural address, is that right makes might. That is, right laws are a beneficial force essential to civil tranquility, domestic peace, and social harmony. If all observed the law, that would be true. How many of you all drive 70 miles an hour only on the speed limit posted? How many of you all drive 35 miles an hour where it's posted? How many of you all drive 45 miles an hour where it's posted? We had a professor who says that if you can't obey those laws, how can you, why are you obeying all, any law? You see, it's the law, yet many times we overlook it for our own convenience. If we can't obey one law, how are we to obey the others? Law provides limited freedom at best. It marks the boundaries within which we can operate freely, but beyond which one cannot go. Often appears in the negative, thou shalt not. For law to work, all must be equally subject to it. And also, officials must administer it even-handedly. We are not free to obey the laws we like and transgress those that we dislike. Whoever seeks freedom under law, whether it be Jewish law, which Paul in Galatians was contrasted with the gospel and viewed as a tutor preparing for the gospel, or some other law. In Galatians 3, he said he is a debtor to the whole law. If you obey one law, you obey all the law. That's where Romans 13 comes in. 
Sometimes we yearn to be free from the law. And we yearn for more freedom that the law cannot provide. There's that old song sang by the Westerners, Don't Fence Me In. We just don't like fences. There are several types of law that have come into be existence in the U.S. system. Some are called historical school view of law. It's the expression of folk custom, a view that served nationalism. One law for the English, one law for the Germans, one for the French, one for the Americans, and so on. There's the philosophy of analytical school of law which views law as something consciously created by lawyers. The state as the entity with sole power to create law, individual rights, has nothing nothing more than the concessions granted by the state of the compulsion, not justice. Then there's the pure theory. Here's where I think we're getting close to, and I'm really afraid of it. And I think that Miss Irma was here, she would probably say the same thing. And our German lady, I can't remember who, what her, who? Ingrid. Ingrid would be saying right now what she has seen in America, she saw in Germany. And this comes from that pure theory of law. It's the school that emphasizes the, the, the procedure by which the state enacts laws, not the substance of the law, As the clue to law, if lawmakers employ the pure procedure or form, law is valid, whatever is its nature. Such a view of flawed law provided the basis for several 20th century dictators. One of them was Adolf Hitler. By law, they said that the Jews were subhuman. And over six million died in the ovens of Auschwitz and other places. But they were legal because Germany passed the law. Folks, I want you to know that the majority does not necessarily mean they're right. Just because we passed a law on abortion does not mean that that law is right by the nature of God. Just because the majority of uh, or the ones that support it, doesn't mean that it is going to the very nature of freedom. What about that child's freedom? It's a person. I don't care what you say, folks. It starts at the moment of conception. It's never just a mass of flesh. It's always a divine spark from God, a human being. But anyone can find freedom in grace. You see, there's a different way of finding freedom. It's available through faith and expressing itself in love. I know that's hard for us to understand. Freedom is available to anyone who believes the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the theme of Galatians, the letter written to the heal the controversy between those who were Gentile and are Jews and the, try to deal with the ceremonial laws and those who insisted that God's grace, which leads one to believe in Jesus Christ, frees one from law's tyranny and liberates the spirit so that he or she can voluntarily accomplish only what law cannot achieve because of compulsion. Spiritual freedom can exist even when human law uh, constricts. Paul said in Philippians 4, 11, I have learned in whatever state I am, abased or abundant, therefore to be content. Now that doesn't mean us just to be tolerant of what's going on. It means for us to be content in what God is doing and allow him to complete the work. You know, we don't understand the bigger picture of what's going on. What God does. And we need to have faith in what's going on is God's will. One of the things that really bothers me about what's happening in America is, 
and it keeps saying to my mind, but it's the end times, it's the end times, it's the end times. I don't have to be satisfied with that. But I know by grace, God's going to take care of us. And I know that we're going to be challenged. I saw a video the other day of a pastor who has had some visions, and I wish I'd never watched it because it really bothers me. You say, what? Visions? Yeah. Go back to Joel where it says, and in the last days, your old mean men shall have visions, your young men shall dream dreams. Folks, we're in that era. This man was saying that he saw calendars flying, and he said it's back in December he had this dream. And he said as the calendars went, it hit one other month, it hit the month of March, and then it hit the month of June, and it tapped three times on the month of March and three times on the month of June. And what, lo and behold, what came in that, he couldn't figure it out. COVID lockdown. In June, a spike again, a lockdown. He said he saw another calendar later on in another dream that he had, and it had November there. And that November, it didn't just tap it, it punched it and said, be prepared. Be prepared. Folks, I don't know if his dream is a prediction of prophecy, but I just have a feeling that what we're about to see come upon us is something we've never seen before, and we need to be ready for it. We need to be trusting in who Jesus Christ is and what he can do for us during this time. The nation has gone through tough times before. You went through World War II, you went through Korea, you've gone through Vietnam, and we've seen all other kind of little outbreaks going off in Afghanistan and all of these things, and the nation can go through it if we trust in who is the leader of our nation, God. That's when we have real liberty. Young people don't be persuaded by a lot of these arguments and philosophies that touch you in such a way that it fulfills your desires. Look to the Word of God. Make sure that what's being said lines up with the Word of God. If it doesn't, throw it out. It's garbage. Straight from the pits of hell. In Matthew 20, 28, it says this. If the Son of God makes you free, we are free indeed in John 8, 36. And from that time on, we never are the same. For like our Master, we then minister as servants, as Matthew 20, 28 says, to the world. So where is real freedom? It's not in force. It's not even in the law. It's in grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Somebody once told me, he says, well, you know, I've got the freedom to swing my arm anywhere I want to. And I said, yes, and your freedom to swing that arm stops at the edge of my nose. We have freedom as Christians. A freedom that we can love and each other and care for each other and truly impact the law of Christ through grace. But when we get out of that framework, we're operating in the world's situation, not in a spiritual situation. I know it's tough, but we're going to be facing it. So I want to encourage you that have just graduated don't be afraid of what the challenges are coming today. Trust in Christ. Amen. Let Him guide your path. Let Him give you instruction. I don't know about the rest of you. I've quit watching the news. There's so much fake news out there. There's only two or three channels that I'll listen to right now that I know I'm getting the truth from. There's so much propaganda going on. I know some of you young people haven't read the book 1984, but you need to. Because it is definitely a statement of what's going on today. And it was written a long time ago. 
If you want to see what's happening, just read it. But you want to see where the future comes and what's going to happen, read the book of Revelation and the end of it. That's where it ends. And I believe we're drawing closer and closer to that end. My word to you is, your pastor, go out and conquer. Conquer the world with the love of Jesus Christ. If we could actually make everyone love Jesus in the same way, we wouldn't have these problems. But we know that's almost an impossibility. But you can be a candlelight in a dark room. You can be that light set upon the hill. So I challenge you to do so. In whatever endeavor you go into, whatever work situation you go into, be the light of Christ in your life. Let people see Jesus in you. We're going to have a verse of invitation. That invitation is to give you an opportunity. If you need to come to the altars to pray, you may do so. If you need to accept Christ as your Savior, come. I'll set up a time where we can meet together and talk over this. Maybe you need to find, just simply come and just rededicate your life. Whatever God's leading you to do this morning, remember, you got freedom in grace. As we stand and as we sing, won't you come? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Alleluia, alleluia. Ask and it shall be. close in kind of a special way today. We want to invite you, if you want to visit with our graduates a little bit more, we've got hot dogs and chips and potato salad and things like that over there. We've got a great big cake, okay? So you all can have a good piece, a little summer picnic kind of meal. Come on over, visit with them. But this is the Sunday before the 4th of July. And I think we would be amiss if we did not give a pledge of allegiance to our flag. So let us close with that, and then I'm going to ask if, uh, Jacob, if you disclose it with prayer after we've had our pledge. Attention, salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Brother Jacob, would you dismiss us, please?